Hi, I'm Zivy Owens, and I am the host of this podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I am also a newly minted USA Today bestselling author of the novel, Blank. I've created a whole community of book lovers around this podcast, a publishing company, reading retreats, a bookstore, and more. Learn more at zivymedia.com or follow me on social at Zivy Owens or join the community at Zivy Readers. Catherine Applegate is the author of The One and Only Family. Catherine is the Newbery Medal winning and a number one New York Times bestselling author of numerous books for young readers, including The One and Only Series, The Ending Series, Crenshaw, Wish Tree, The Roscoe Riley Rules Chapter Book Series, and The Animorph Series. She lives with her family in Nevada. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss The One and Only Family. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I am so delighted to be here. Oh, okay. So tell everybody, what is this? Fi- this is the final installment, right? This, you're not going past here or should I not say no, that? No, no. This is it. This is it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> tell everybody what, what the book is about, please. Well, you know, this is a continuation of a, what it's now become a four book quartet, I guess you'd call it, that started with the one and only Ivan, um, which many people have have realized at this point was based on a true story. There really was an Ivan gorilla who ended up, of all things, in Tacoma, Washington, in the middle of a mall, and spent 27 awful years there. So I fictionalized that story and eventually expanded upon it. We had the one and only Bob. Bob is a, a very uh, sarcastic, charming dog who is voiced by Danny DeVito in the movie. And the one and only Ruby, a baby elephant. And I really thought I was done. But then I I was thinking about the fact that uh, the real Ivan may well have been a twin. We don't know for sure. He was found with another baby uh, gorilla who appeared to be the same size and age, a female. And unfortunately, she died almost as soon as she got to Tacoma. And Western lowland gorillas, you know, do have twins occasionally. It can be a familial thing, as it is with humans. So I thought, wouldn't it be fascinating to see our dear friend Ivan actually be a dad, even though in real life, uh, as far as we know, he never was. Wow. And I know I jokingly asked if if it was a spoiler to reveal that Ivan has twins because it comes as such a surprise during the reading of it, even though you can see it in the cover and you know what what's going to happen. Because the surprise for many people when they have twins is just that. Like, here is the baby, and then here is another baby. Oh my gosh, what do we do now? And the terror that Ivan feels that I'm sure so many parents have felt at the same time feels just so, so real. So tell me a little bit more about that. And as I, I mentioned to you, I have boy-girl twins of my own who are now 17, about to be 17. But yeah, that moment when you're like, how am I going to deal with two sets of temper tantrums of two-year-olds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is an epiphany for him for sure. And in fact, it and I try always when I'm writing these to to stay as close as I can to animal behavior. And and you know, it's always on a spectrum because of course you're going to be anthropomorphic when you're when you're talking about animals. But in fact, sometimes gorillas and in this case Ivan uh is is quite isolated for uh various reasons. There isn't a troop around to help his I, I guess we say wife, Kenyani, as she anticipates becoming a mom. And one of the things the keepers do is present them with these stuffed toy gorillas so they can start, you know, holding them and experiencing what, uh, in, in the most uh, simplistic fashion, what it's like to be a parent. And so I tried as much as I could to kind of follow through that timeline. And Ivan is, of course, bewildered even though all the keepers know that he is about to be the dad of twins when he actually ends up with two. And it it is, you're right, absolutely the most glorious moment of his life and the most terrifying because he's thinking, oh, imagine what it'll be like to be a dad and, and share my life and my wisdom. And then he suddenly remembers what it's like when you see a toddler tantrum. Yeah. Multiply that by two, as, as I'm sure you can recall. Yes, unfortunately. 
<laughs> Actually, we did the same thing. We had a, a dog when the twins were born, and we gave the dog like a doll, you know, a doll baby, and like tried to pretend like it was a baby to like get get the dog used to the fact that there would be babies around. And anyway, then we even had the doll cry. I feel like a dog trainer told me to do this. We had a doll that you like push the stomach and it would like mimic the real sounds of crying. Oh, just I to, love it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the things you do when pregnant. <laughs> no, of course it didn't work. Of course it didn't work. No. <laughs> You know, the the thing that Ivan feels right away when seeing the kids, which again, so many parents relate to, is this feeling protect, protect, protect. And that feeling like doesn't go away, does it? And, and it's pervasive across species and everything. Mm-hmm. And it is just so evolutionary. You, you know why it's there. But to see it written on the page like this and to know as a parent that feeling and instinct, <laughs> the protection just doesn't end, right? When does it ever let up? Never. Boy, I t- you tell me. I have uh, <laughs> two daughters in their 20s, and it, it it's not that it doesn't get easier. Of course, it, it, in many ways, it does. You're not, you know, a tw- on call 24 hours a day. But the worry doesn't go away. It, it I guess it never does. And you want them to take risks, and you, you know they're going to. And you the other thing is you remember when you were young and how fearless you were, and you want you know, you want that to happen for them. But boy, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> you had all these little gems sort of sprinkled throughout. Can I just read a couple lines? Do you mind? Oh, that no, of course. <laughs> well, this was funny. I was perhaps a bit too optimistic earlier. I can now report with some authority that parenting is definitely not as easy as it looks. That was great. <laughs> totally agree. But you said in this part, I laugh, this is page 183, I laugh until my eyes well with tears. Once again, I'm reminded that it's possible to be happy and sad, worried and hopeful, confused and certain, all at the same time, especially when you love someone dearly. Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel that so deeply. (laughs) I know. And it's, I guess it's the human condition. You're right. It's, or the primate condition. It's, I'm sure, crosses all species that endless anxiety, but it's, it's, you know, I guess it, it works because here we are. I know. Yeah. So, so there's good reason for that, I guess. <laughs> are you sad to have sort of put these characters to bed like, and not write about them anymore? Oh, yeah. You know, it's so funny with series especially, uh, but certainly even with a single title, these these characters become part of you and they're a family. And this has been a good, you know, 10 years or so, you know, they're part of my life and it does feel sad to let them go. I just did a book tour and a lot of kids were asking, well, what about the twins? You could do a book about the twins or what about Stella? And you just know it's time. It came full circle. I felt like the narrative arc ended where it needed to. And hopefully on a, on a very hopeful note, because I think that's so important for kids when you started, when you wrote The One and Only Ivan, did you know it would be a quartet? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it'd be a book. <laughs> I make a point to tell both struggling writers and, and kids that I got about halfway through the original manuscript and literally tossed it in the trash. I just I could not believe that anybody would read First Person Gorilla. I, I just thought I was, I'd gone way out on this crazy tangent. And you're a writer, you know that feeling. Of, <laughs> what have I done? And so I eventually pulled it back out and thought, you know, I want to know what happens. And I rewrote it about, you know, a million times. But that, of course, is, is what writing's all about, is rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. Oh, my gosh. I remember I talked to Garth Stein a while back about the art of racing in the rain from the point oh, of view I of the dog. So good. But he said people, like, laughed him out of the room. Like his agent was like, you have lost your mind. You're writing a book from the point of view of a dog. Like no one will do this. No one will ever publish this. And it took him forever to get it published. And then it sold a million copies. And it was absolutely lovely. Oh, that's so fascinating, isn't it? Because you just never know. Yeah. Until until it's on the page. Yeah, exactly. So tell me about your whole writing career and how you got started. Like when did when did you know this is what you wanted to do? How did you know not to give up? How did you just, you know, sort of get the wisdom to pull things out of the trash when they had something to them? 
<laughs> well, you noticed I laughed right away because, <laughs> you know, like sausage and legislation, it was it was very messy. I started out, well, I got a, a liberal arts degree and then became the world's worst waitress because that's what you do <laughs> when you have a liberal arts degree. <laughs> and, and then and I was terrified to write. It seemed like the most humiliating way to fail because it was so public. So eventually I became a ghostwriter. And I was the consummate hack. And I mean that in the best possible way. It's it's a good way to learn your craft. And I wrote, oh, like 17 Sweet Valley twins. Women of a certain age will remember Sweet Valley. I, I am of that age. And that is amazing. And <laughs> I gave Jessica her first period. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Wow. Yes. I'm you very were like proud. God. <laughs> So, and I did, I did tons of work for Disney, you know, Aladdin, Little Mermaid, that kind of thing. And lots of series with packagers where my name wouldn't be on the book mm -hmm. and eventually got up the nerve to try something. And it, it took me a long, long time. Wow. I go through a book actually after my first giant failure when I couldn't sell my first novel after an agent took it out and blah, blah, blah. And the consolation prize, I guess, is she's like, well, you could ghostwrite this book. And I was like, okay, which was fun. You know, I mean, I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, you talk, I, at the time there was no Zoom. I, this was in 2005 or something. I would just like be on the phone with the authors and then transcribe. And then they were kind enough to give me a with attribution on the cover. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> I know. It's like, I got a with, like with Zivi. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, you did all the heavy lifting, no doubt. So, <laughs> But still, most of the time yeah. that, you know, I knew that no. it easily could have been the ca case. But I think ghostwriting is, is really interesting. And it is a great way to sort of hone in a voice by putting yourself literally in someone else's mind. So yeah, good, good starting. Exactly. Point. It is. It's really good practice because you are adopting somebody else's voice and you better, you better get it right. Yeah. Especially if you're writing, uh, as it turns out, say Donald Duck for Disney, because of the, <laughs> you yeah. better get that right. Trust me. Yeah. That's a, that's a tall order. I mean, the Sweet Valley oh, Twins and Donald <laughs> Disney characters. I mean, come on. I mean, those are beloved by everyone, <laughs> maybe different groups, but Perhaps not. So then tell me about like the first project, because you've done so many different types of books and all of that. What was the progression like? And how did you like do a, you know, just all the different things, children's books and middle grades? Well, and I actually, and I used to not admit this, but I thought it would be very easy to write a Harlequin romance. I, I was not a reader and I hasten to add that there are fantastic romance writers out there. I just wasn't one of them. <laughs> So with my husband, I attempted to write two Harlequins. And to this day, I won't tell anybody what my pen name was. And eventually, my husband and I did a series together called Animorphs. And we wrote it with Scholastic. There were 63 maybe books in the series. And we wrote probably 40 or 50 of them. Wow. And that was back in the day when books came out every month. There was a Babysitter's Club and Goosebumps. Kids love that because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you rush back to the bookstore, to the Scholastic Book Club, and you grab that next book. So that was exhausting because we had a new baby and we were, you know, passing around the baby and the coffee and the book nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, uh, but it was a steep learning curve. But now I will go to book events and this is such a reminder that I've aged. And these, <laughs> these eight-year-olds who are Animorphs fans will show up and they have Animorphs tattoos and they've named their babies after Carol. Oh my gosh. So it's so cool. They're just the best. They're the most wonderful fans on earth. They're just, uh, they all grow up to be delightful human beings. And I take full credit. <laughs> you should, as you should. <laughs> So the, and once we'd done that, I, you know, we, I, we were both so tired of writing series and my husband started writing YA and I, I drifted more toward middle grade. And that's when I started my first real book, I call it was called Home of the Brave. And it was in free verse about Sudanese refugee. So it was a huge departure. Wow. And then Crenshaw, by the way, was required reading for all my kids. So, um, yeah, I know. I can't believe it. We have so many copies because, like, as one kid <laughs> and then the next kid at the same school. And da, da, da. So, yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Congratulations on that. So how do you feel like you're able to write? I mean, it's one thing for us to ghostwrite, but to write from the point of view of another species altogether – and put yourself, I mean, I guess I could kind of imagine what it's like to be my dog. But aside from that, like, I think it would be harder for me. How do you do it? 
And not that there's ever a way, but I don't know. How do you get into character, so to speak? I love that you say not that there's ever a way because it's spoken like a writer. To write. <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's, it's so messy, but I will research is a huge part of it. And I love doing that because I am the consummate procrastinator and it's such a great way to not write. For example, I did a book called Otter recently written from the point of view of an, a Southern sea otter in Monterey Bay and tried to stay as close as I could to the actual experience while, of course, pretending to be an otter. And I had it vetted by marine biologists, and I I tried to really hew as close as I could. But at the end of the day, you know, you're taking this big leap. But it was a chance to go hang out with otters and do fascinating research. So I I think that's a lot of it. You know, you do the best you can to understand what their perceptions of the world are. But, you know, there's like Jack London at one end, and then there's, you know, Frog and Toad at the other, and there's a spectrum of approaches. And it kind of depends on the book. Did you know that Frog and Toad is now a TV show? I just saw that yesterday. Oh, yeah, I know. Kidding. No, I was trying to watch something else. And of course, like there it was on, I don't know, one of the streaming channels. Oh, I got to check that out. I don't know. It's, it, you know, I'm a kind of a purist. It's It's so perfect the way it is, but okay. Yeah. Your movie was so good though. <laughs> that was so fun. I got to go to London and watch it being filmed. Really? And oh my gosh. It was so cool. And Angelina Jolie, who was a producer, was on the next set over uh, doing uh, Maleficent. So, she, oh so we gosh. got to go chat with her with her golden contacts in and it, <laughs> it was just <laughs> fascinating. Wow. That was our Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving family movie the cousins and everything. So yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So what projects are you working on next? What are you working on now and what's coming out next? Those are probably different things, but. Um, Well, I have a picture book version of Otter coming out with Macmillan with this, uh, the illustrators done many of my covers with them, Charles Santoso, who's just amazing. And it's nothing but adorable baby otters. I didn't really need to write anything because Charles is is so magnificent. I also have a picture book coming out with the amazing Lita Judge that is based on Ruby for HarperCollins. And she, too, is amazing. So that's going to be really charming. And I have a second book in a series called Dogtown that I wrote with a um, a fellow writer who's amazing, uh, Jennifer Childenko who won a Newbery Honor for the Al Capone series, the Alcatraz series. Mm -hmm. And that was really fun because we're both dog lovers. So it's about dogs and robot dogs and, you know, how can you go wrong? And actually my, my current work in progress is involves stuffed animals, which I have never done. And it's, it's a whole different leap into, you know, the unknown. So we'll see. Oh, that's so fun. Do you have a lot of fun with what you're doing? It seems like it, but is it? Oh, no, it's really hard. (laughs) Boring and frustrating. No, I always tell kids it's just, it's a job like any job. And, you you know, you have good days and bad days. Only when I step away from it do I realize how much I love it. You know, I sometimes tell writers, if you want to know if you're going to be a writer, tell yourself you can't write for a month. And if you can't stand it, then, you know, you're meant to be doing it because mm. yeah, you know, it, it takes a certain resilience. Interesting. I feel like anytime I have a deadline or something, I'm like, I like run the other way. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. not alone, trust me. <laughs> I'm so sure I've set records. <laughs> what other advice do you have for aspiring authors? You know, I've been telling kids, it's not grammatically correct, but uh, embrace your weird. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, and you know, because look at all the writers and creatives, you know, we're a weird bunch. (laughs) We tend to look at the world differently. And I mean that absolutely with total affection, because I think it's a a real gift. And when kids are starting to write, and and adults for that matter, there's so much pressure to conform, to be like everybody else, especially, you know, as you head into middle school and high school. And remembering that little weird part of you is magical, because that's why creatives can look at the world differently. So I think it's really important to remember that. I love it. Well, congratulations. This book was so sweet and special and took me back to my <laughs> the early days of twin parenting. <laughs> so celebrating not being good and bad. Good and bad. Good and bad. But you know, the notion of of making a family and 
making your nest in whatever shape and how mm-hmm. much we should respect all the other species and not take ourselves too seriously, sharing the world, all that good stuff. So important. So anyway, true delight. I've You've delighted my whole family for hours on end in various mediums. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It's been a joy. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you love it, please leave a review and follow us on social at Zibby Owens and at Zibby Readers. <laughs>